So a few weeks ago, this image by a Hungarian programmer called, um, I think it's Joschev, but uh, I'll just call him Yoko because I'm not sure how to pronounce his name properly. But uh, this image made the rounds on the internet and um, it's quite beautiful and quite inspiring and I thought I'd share my take on the challenge and my ideas on it. So the original challenge was to um, generate a computer image, a uh, computer generate an image, sorry, that contains every available color in a fixed bit color space, so for example 15 bit color space, exactly once. So in this image, every color in 15 bit color space, 5 bits per color channel, uh, exists exactly once. And um, and Yoko came up with quite a pretty algorithm uh, with very beautiful results by tweaking the um, parameters a bit. And um, yeah, it, it's just quite gorgeous to look at. Um, and especially the way the images were generated were very interesting to look at. Uh, I mean, on top of that, the pictures themselves were pretty. Uh, Here's a, an in, a zoomed in GIF showing uh, an image being generated. And it reminded me of uh, actually of already existing artwork, computer generated artwork. Um, for example, this one, uh, Evolver by Driesen and Verstappen. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this work, because I think it's quite cool. Um, what it does, and I hope you also kind of see the connection, um, it, it doesn't walk the full color space like Yoko's algorithm does. It only, in quotes, um, generates art. Uh, it, it uses uh, cellular automata, so uh, like Conway's Game of Life is also a cellular automata, to generate an image with a certain rule set. And uh, their installation has different rule sets and the resulting images are also different. So what this installation uh, does, and uh, this is in 2006, so this is before touch screens were widely available. I want you to keep that in mind. Um, it uh, first generates a number of rules, so let's say eight rule sets, and it then displays four of those rule sets at a time, or not say eight, let's say let's say 32. And if somebody walks by he could select one of those four rule sets to be the best looking one. So that one would win, so to speak. And then a new set of rules would be displayed and would generate an image. And this would go on for a while until uh, all rule sets were exhausted. And um, then the winners would be combined and generate a new set of rule sets. And then these would be displayed again and people could repeat the process. And over a longer period, this way, the, the rule sets would evolve, basically. So if you recall, the basic algorithm, algorithm for um, evolution is variation, selection, and heredity. Well, the variation comes from the combining of the existing rule sets, and probably there were some mutations involved as well. Uh, heredity comes from the rule sets being based on older rule sets, so presumably also looking somewhat similar. And the selection, and this is the interesting part, to me at least, comes from humans choosing the version they found the most aesthetically pleasing. Um, and this, for example, parallels what you in nature would call sexual selection, where if you look at, for example, the peacock, it has these this whole set of feathers, which is very impractical and makes it quite easy to be eaten. <laughs> Or caught by uh, by wild by other animals, but because the females don't want to mate with a uh, with the male peacock unless it has these feathers, uh, the species ha is sexually selected for this aesthetic but completely non-functional uh, set of feathers, and this is kind of the same thing. It, it's kind of it's aesthetically selected for a certain look. Um, and after having this installation run for, let's say, a week or a month, the prettiest algorithms would be chosen, 
and they will be generating a large print which would be printed out at a certain location. So I think this is a pretty neat um, computer generated art installation um, and the results are also pretty cool. So that ties it to my uh, my work to a degree, although my work isn't as cool, because I also have made work which involved a lot of fancy colors and which involved evolutionary principles. Here we have um, 20,000 particles. It has um, they have very different colors. Some colors are stronger than others. Some colors are more aggressive than others, and some colors are more genetically stable than others. So if a particle reproduces, their children are more likely to have the same look. So uh, this simulation will automatically select for those colors. And here you have a graph with peaks showing the strongest in all of these colors. Um, anyway, that's not really important. The point is, I also made stuff with um, colorful uh, computer generated images, so I felt both inspired by Yoko's um, images and also kind of obliged to at least try to uh, come up with an algorithm of my own because otherwise I would probably lose my already abysmal street cred. And I thought I would use this opportunity to explain how these uh, the movement of these particles works because I've had some friends ask me how I did that. And I figured, ah, why not uh, share my trade secrets, especially because it's actually quite simple. Um, so I'll first explain how these particles move, and then I'll show you how I turn that into uh, my take on the RGB challenge. So let's start with the most basic of um, random walkers. Uh, we have a random walker xy class, it has an x and a y position, a velocity, which I set to one pixel, um, and every frame it drifts. And what does that mean? It means I choose a random number between 0 and 4, so one, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, and depending on which number is chosen, it takes a step to the right, to the left, up or down. And the results are as you would expect if you've ever seen a simulation like this. It's, it's jittery, brownian motion like boring stuff. So um, what can we do to improve this? Well, the thing is it just steps left to right, up and down, and it just as often just ends up where it starts as that it goes somewhere. What really is missing is this feeling that it's actually trying to go somewhere. That's what makes motion of particles interesting to us, the, the idea that it's going somewhere instead of just not knowing what it's doing, which is what happens here. So what we can do is go from this X and Y jittering to um, taking a step uh, but uh, varying an angle. So this is random walker angle. It's just like before, it has an X, a Y, and a velocity, but now it also has an angle, phi, and an arc. So every turn, it takes a step in its given angle, but before it does that, it changes its angle by a random step, which is between a certain arc. And um, so let's see the results of that. So if we choose a very wide arc, for example, um, uh, half tau, or as most people call it, pi, it can, every frame, take a step in any possible direction, basically. So if anything, this would should be more random than uh, the XY version because it can step in any direction. And as you can see, it is. But if we narrow this arc, it should be a bit more limited in its direction. So yeah, here we go. It seems to go forward, whatever that means, for a bit more before it changes its turn. And uh, we can keep decreasing this angle. I'll just skip a few of them so it doesn't take too long. See, it goes in fairly straight lines, but sometimes it takes a sudden turn here. Um, 
So now we have, um, I think, a bit more interesting looking random walker. It still moves unpredictable and yet somewhat more predictable looking to our eyes. Um, it's still quite jittery though. It has this, I mean, it, it looks interesting in a root-like way or well, maybe some people watching this can get itchy and think worms. I hope I don't cause any rashes. Um, and a few years ago, I thought, I want to create something that doesn't have that jitter in it. And I thought the reason it jitters is because it has a random angular velocity. So what if I don't change the angular velocity, but the angular acceleration? That's basically... Uh, what I did. So I created, uh, now call it a drifter class. It has like the random walker with an angle, it has x, y, and phi, and r. And um, on top of that, it has uh, an acceleration and uh, an angular acceleration and an angular velocity. So what it does, and I'll show you the, the unfixed version first. It um, every turn it randomly chooses an angular acceleration. It then multiplies it with a certain factor. Um, I'll show you why in a bit. It adds that acceleration to the angular velocity, and then it adds the angular velocity to the angle. Quite straightforward. So um, uh, this constant here determines this given f. So let's start with f is one. So Quite a high angular velocity, and let's start with quite a high uh, arc for angular acceleration as well. What do we get? Well, we still get this random jittering. That's not what we're looking for. So let's decrease this arc to a very low one. Okay, this seems to have smoother curves, but it ends up in these points very often. What is going on? Well, um, when you think about it, constant angular acceleration will lead to extremely high angular speeds. And if you have extremely angular, high angular speeds, it will just like have a very, very tiny circle, a uh, circle less than one pixel large in most of the cases. So you get these circular points. Even though this angular acceleration randomly goes in both directions, and you would say, well, on average it should be almost zero, um, that doesn't mean the average speed should be almost zero. So what we can do to fix this um, is, well, there's two things we can do. First, we can make this acceleration slower. So let's do that first. Uh, so now the, this is the divisor, divisor of this, so this is 100th of, uh, of this angle. Then, yeah, it goes in fairly straight lines, and it can still accelerate to circles. And as you can see, we have smooth curves now. But again, there's nothing stopping these things from ending up in, in these very high spinning circles. So Eventually, and I'm going to wait for that, you'll, you'll end up with quite a lot of these singularity points again. Um, so what we need to really fix this is, in, uh, is add negative feedback. So this is almost the same. The only thing we added here is minus uh, d phi, so minus the angular speed. So basically, the higher the angular speed, the stronger the bias of the acceleration in the opposing direction. So the higher the speed, the more likely it accelerates in the opposite direction. And depending on how big the, the angle delta is, so the angular arc, the, the higher the speed can be before it's guaranteed to be, before the acceleration is guaranteed to be in the opposing direction. And by tweaking these numbers, you can get different looking results. So now I'll add a, a fairly quick feedback and a fairly small arc 
and it has negative feedback, and the results should be. Yeah, okay. Uh, it doesn't end up in, um, in circles very often. Why? Because it's not allowed to go very fast before it gets this negative bias. Um, and it, it changes quite slowly in direction because I have very slow feedback. So in theory, if I made this arc wider, I should get uh, a much, I should get more um, vortexes, so singularity-like swirls. And I do. Also, uh, it's much faster for fairly obvious reasons. So to counter that, I make the feedback a bit smaller. And let's see what happens. There we go. Look at that. It still goes into points, uh, but it's quite smooth. And it also is guaranteed to not stay in these points for too long because the bias pulls it in the opposing direction quite fast. Um, I think this is a bit too wide though, so let's make it this, and yeah, I think this looks nice. So there you have it. Smooth swirls, and uh, no singularities, and it still feels somewhat random to us. So that's the, uh, the drifter class explained. So now on to how I actually use this to generate an image that contains every color in a certain color space exactly once. Um, so the idea I had was I take one of these drifters and I make it walk across the screen. And as it does so, whenever it encounters a spot where there is n it hasn't drawn a, a pixel before, it draws a pixel. And if it... Uh, it walks over stuff, it has a place it already has drawn a pixel, it ignores it. And as it draws a line, it um, walks through the entire RGB color space. So what I need for that is um, a palette, which contains the whole RGB color space in a nice, smooth, continuous way. And then I'm pretty much set. So let's first look at that palette. Um, I went with a fairly boring solution. So if, if you take the naive way of looking at things, so you have a, a red, a green, and a blue channel. Um, le what you can do is you can just take three, four loops. The outer loop is the slowest one, the inner loop is the slightly faster one, and the innermost loop has the highest frequency. So uh, this is 6 with color space, so that's 64 values. This goes from 0 to 64 um, for each of these, and you just walk through it linearly. And the result of this will be uh, a palette like this. Um, okay, it's very dull. Uh, you can see it goes from 0 to green every uh, 64 pixels. It grows from uh, it, it takes one step up in red every 64 pixels because that's the this intermediate loop. And every 64 times 64 pixels, it takes one step up in the blue range. So the blue gradually increases, green increases the most. Um, by the way, the reason we chose uh, I chose blue to go the slowest and green to have the highest frequency is because human eyes are the best at detecting variety across the green color space and the worst at detecting variety across the blue color space. So it makes more sense to look uh, to divide it like that as well. So what might be nicer is instead of going up linearly, which has this very jaggy result, is to go up and down in the, the green color space. So from zero to maximum and then back, up and down, and the same for green and the same for blue. Um, here's the code for that. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not really in the mood to explain that. But the result of that is this. So as you can see, this is just, this is much smoother. I, I wouldn't say it's aesthetically pleasing, but it's much less jarring than 
this version. I think you'll agree to that. So um, here's my color space. So I take that drifter from earlier, it walks across the whole screen, and as it draws, it just walks through the whole array, like 0 to 64, and it just goes uh, from here all the way to here. Um, okay, that's the theory. <laughs> now I'm going to show you what it looks like in practice. Uh, so let's give this a bit more yeah, like this. So it walks through the entire image, and as it encounters black, I'll, I'll reset the picture so you can have a better look. We have this one drifter, which starts in the corner for now. It walks through the, the picture as it encounters unpainted space. It paints colors in the RGB color space. And uh, if we look at the individual channels, this is the green channel, so it goes up and down quite frequently, as I showed earlier in the palette. This is red, it goes up a bit less frequently, it only has gone up and down once for now. And we expect the blue one to be very dark because it only will go up exactly once, and you can hardly see it here. I don't know if the uh, screencast will capture this actually. So, um, also as you might notice, at the corners it has these smooth curves that I had before, but in the center it is uh, straight. I, I basically added a little bit of logic that made it um, round down to exact to uh, uh, straight corners in the center and um, average between them so gradually transition into smooth corners in the edge because I thought that would look nicer. I'm not going to explain how I did that here. It's, it's quite trivial actually. So um, here it draws this entire picture and as it does that um, I'll just wait you know what I'll just uh, I'll just make it generate a bit bigger picture because uh, yeah I think that's nice and then in the meantime I'll show you um, some alternatives while it's generating that. So uh, there we go. Now it's generating a slightly bigger than um, actual than the actual resolution picture. And um, I'll show some work. Show some work I did earlier. So here is a here's a picture, and here's one with uh, with uh, where it changes its angle more slowly, so it has much bigger curves. Here's one where it changes its angles quite quickly, so it has much smaller curves. Um, yeah. Now, what's kind of interesting about this these type of pictures? So, you know, I, I want to discuss the whole thing that every RGB color is unique. What that means is that if I invert this picture, so okay, it doesn't show a nice smooth. Uh, um, histogram because I added these black pictures below. But if you add, if you invert the picture, it still um, it still has every color exactly once, right? Makes perfect sense. So for every picture you create, you actually create two possible solutions to this challenge. And um, not only that, but because of the way these color frequencies are set up, and I just want to emphasize here, this only works because I chose the palette in this particular way. Um, because of that, I could actually invert every color channel individually as well. So that's two possibilities here, two possibilities here, two possibilities here. So that's eight different possibilities in total. And on top of that, I can swap around these color channels. So I could swap the, the green and the red color channel, and I would still have a valid solution to this RGB challenge. And you have six possible combinations for that. So that's six times eight. That's 48 possible solutions you could draw from one solution. For every solution you generate, you have uh, 48 possible solutions. Um, 
uh, also it's kind of interesting like I don't know about you guys but I, I really like those the, the blue color selling in particular just in its on its own it has this very nice looking transition from dark to light or if you prefer uh, light to dark anyway um, but wait there's more because and I'll, I'll leave it up to you to figure out why this is but because of the way we arrange this because of the way every color fits within the slower frequency color I could move these colors I could give them an offset so to speak and and no matter what offset I give them I would still generate a picture which has every color exactly once okay I could I could um, shift the the red channel uh, to the right by a random number and it would still create a unique uh, a picture with every color being unique now why is this fun well why does this uh, give us some extra possibilities well there is this quite old-school technique called color cycling I'll, I'll uh, share the links to this website and also the other websites I shown before in the about section of this YouTube movie um, but this is a very old-school technique which was used in the early 90s before we had modern graphics cards so uh, a bit of history lesson um, and also, um, imagine it's the early 90s you just have a, a cool new computer and it can display this incredibly high resolution of 640 by 480 pixels at a given time. Oh, that's a lot. That that's a crazy amount of, of picture data to to display. And you simply do not have the storage, um, nor the computer power to to load up a whole new frame every turn. But uh, because this is VGA we're talking about, it has a limited palette of 256 colors. Um, but actually, it, it chooses a palette of 256 colors from a much larger color space. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but imagine you have much more colors to choose from, but you can only choose up to 256 colors from that. And this is just a little lookup table inside your graphics card or graphics well, processing unit, I'm not quite sure what it was back then. And you can change that lookup table quite cheaply, and then it would instantly refresh the whole screen without having to load a new bitmap with this new lookup table. If you technically choose your palette and technically place pixels, uh, as you can see here, you could uh, generate an animation by changing the palette without loading in a new bitmap every frame so this is like a form of both like data compression and and animation technique um, so let's look at the raindrops here most of the time they have the palette of the background picture so they look like a static image but as you can see these these blocks moving by those are the raindrops moving through the palette and similarly uh, the waterfall in the back um, oh, uh, here we go a shift in the palette through this hand dithered mind you hand dithered image you create the animation of falling misty water this is done by uh, Mark Ferrari he was like uh, one of the best, if not the best, computer graphics artists uh, when it comes to this kind of this type of animation. Uh, like I said, I'll share the uh, links to this in the in the about section. And it, there's like much more uh, different types of images he made. Uh, you can watch them all online, and they're all gorgeous to look at. Um, so as I said, this. Um, how does this relate to um, the image I'm creating here? It's still busy. Uh, it will take a while because you know the more pixels you have, the more uh, 
the longer it has to walk before it actually happens to hit a particular empty spot. So it can take quite a while before this whole image is finished. Um, well, recall the four different color channels. And recall that, as I said, I can give these color channels an offset. So th this, this picture is basically just one unique line walking through the entire image. So if instead of putting in a, a color, I put in an index starting at zero and ending at, um, well, this is seven bit color space, so uh, I, I don't know, a large number. And then simply shifting the index by one, I can uh, um, create I can shift through all, all colors in the, uh, in the image and do this color cycling thing again. So this is the, the blue color channel. And now I'm shifting the colors through the image. So it, it's, it's moving through the drawn line. Uh, pretty cool, I think. Uh, here's the same thing for the red color space, so it's slightly higher frequency. And here is the very high frequency green color space. It moves quite slowly. I don't know if you can notice this. Maybe my um, screen capture will compress it out because it's you know pixel perfect <laughs> shifting. So um, okay, before I sh I go to the RGB color version of this, uh, I have to give an epilepsy warning. I, I don't know uh, it might trigger an episode for some people. So here we go, three, two, one, and uh, oh, it's quite slow. Uh, it's because it's a large color space, so it shifts quite slowly. It's not that bad. If you do this at low resolutions, you get a very, very like fast trippy effect. It's like a, a bad trip or something. And um, just so you know, um, just, just imagine this picture is already finished, so these black spaces are also all filled in. Um, at any given moment, uh, every pixel still has a unique color. Um, even though I'm shifting these colors through, and even though I could do this at different speeds, uh, or at opposing speeds, um, the resulting image would still be one where every color is unique. Because of the way we set up the color frequencies, and because of the way yeah, this whole thing works. And then on top of that, we could, in theory, apply these 48 variants as well that I mentioned earlier. But I'm not going to do that now. So, um, yeah, that's basically uh, all I have to say about that. Uh, let's, let's give it one more try. I'm going to give it a smaller color space, and I'm going to make it... So it, instead of fitting in um, exactly once, I'm just going to make it as big as the whole screen. So there's going to be uh, black pixels. So the black pixel will no longer be unique in this picture. And uh, I want these I want these curves to be quite smooth. So I'm going to let's see. What is it? No. I'm not convinced. Yeah, there we go. So because because there's more empty space now, it's more likely to finish. Um, statistically speaking, it can still take a while. Once this little circle here is uh, square, then it means we've blocked the entire color space. Um, But in the meanwhile, green, red, blue, and uh, ah, there we go, full color space. So here's our uh, trippy result. Ah, well, that's that. That's my take on the RGB challenge. Uh, I hope uh, I've shown you some interesting stuff today, and you maybe you've even learned something. I'll uh, I'll see you next time, and. Uh, Thanks, Joko, for inspiring me. Like I said, I'll I'll share all the links in the co in the about section below, so you can 
find the websites yourself. See you next time. Bye.